It's my pleasure to introduce Ryan. Uh, Ryan obtained his uh, PhD from the University of Cambridge, uh, and then he moved on to, uh, in 2019, to Cornell University, where he works on, uh, where he worked on the preparation for James Webb. And recently, he moved to uh, the University of Michigan uh, as a NASA, uh, NASA Sagan Fellow. And today, he's going to talk to you about um, the new era of retrieval analysis uh, with James Webb. OK, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Jima, for the invitation to come and speak to you all today, and especially for everyone who's uh, frantically working on JWST proposals now, for taking the time to uh, listen to even more about JWST instead of uh, rushing and writing these. So, so yeah, so I'll be talking about something called atmospheric retrieval, which is, um, for anyone who hasn't heard the term, it's essentially just a fancy term we use for model fitting in the context of interpreting spectra of exoplanet atmospheres to infer what these planets are actually made of and the various physical and chemical processes at play. And with this incredible paradigm change that we're going through at the moment, now that JWST is operational, it's fundamentally changing what we can infer about these atmospheres. And there's just such a wide variety of questions that we, we've wanted to know about exoplanets ever since the first discoveries of these planets in the early 90s. In particular, how does our solar system compare to the diversity of worlds that we've been inferring? What ultimately are these planetary atmospheres made of, and how can we use the chemical abundances we measure to learn fundamental insights about the mechanisms underlying planet formation? And ultimately, as we push down to lower mass and lower radii planets, finally we'll be able to start getting a handle on what these, um, this plethora of rocky worlds that we've discovered all throughout our galaxy are actually like, and potentially the long-term goal of discovering whether or not we're alone in the universe. So here is the uh, compulsory graphic summarizing all of the exoplanets that we have detected to date in both mass space on the left and radius space on the right. Um, this diagram's a little bit deceptive because there are no error bars shown here. There's a lot of uncertainties in many of these planets. But you can already see, even by eye, some key categories of planets clustered here, um, even not accounting for detection biases. So focusing on the top right, the first, many of the early discoveries that we found, we call them um, hot Jupiters. So these are planets around about the mass or radius of Jupiter, but in very close in orbits of a couple of days or so, um, or about um, five to ten times closer than Mercury in their semi-major axes. But one of the big surprises really has been filling in this gap in radius space between the Earth and the ice giants, Neptune and Uranus, and discovering that the most common type of planet in our own galaxy are these mini Neptunes or super Earths, for which we, we don't really have much ground context for what these planets are actually like. Um, and of course, then there are the terrestrial planets like um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and these cool giant planets that we're just starting to fill in now with direct imaging and radio velocity surveys, like the um, outer planets in our own solar system. But if we fold together these two diagrams and actually restore the error bars, here I'm showing the collection of planets for which we have measurements more precise than 30% in both their masses and radii. And just from a diagram like this, you can already start to infer some information about the bulk composition of these worlds. So much of the hot Jupiters we've discovered are in this top right corner here, consistent with a mass and radius um, dominated by hydrogen and helium. And potentially we have a transition kicking in at around 10 Earth masses between these planets like the TRAPPIST-1 system shown down here that are very consistent with the bulk composition of Earth and Venus, with um, potentially this being indicative of core accretion taking place at around 10 Earth masses leading to a rapid onset of a hydrogen helium envelope. But the reason that I wanted to highlight this diagram is that just from mass and radius space, we can see how similar the Earth and Venus actually are. When we know from their atmospheres, these are fundamentally different worlds in terms of their habitability and their past atmospheric evolution. So if we really want to understand what these worlds are like, we have to go beyond just masses and radii to atmospheric measurements, in particular through atmospheric spectra. So there are many different ways that we can probe the atmospheric composition of exoplanets. I'm going to be focusing this talk primarily on the transit technique. Essentially, um, qualitatively what we're doing 
is just measuring how the effective area of the annulus of an exoplanet from its atmosphere changes with wavelength, probing the different characteristic absorption bands or absorption lines from a wide variety of different chemical species. So on the left here, I have a qualitative schematic I put together about some of the information content that is contained in a transmission spectrum of a hot Jupiter. So at the shortest wavelengths, we're probing scattering processes that can be Rayleigh scattering from background molecular hydrogen or um, even more enhanced strong scattering from small particulate um, photochemical hazes, for example, especially as you push into the UV. In the optical, we also have resonance lines from the ground to electronic excited states of sodium and potassium. And as we push further into the infrared, that's where we routinely, with Hubble at least, pre-JWST, saw signatures of water absorption in the atmospheres of many hot giant planets. So comparing the schematic to real observations, I really like this paper from David Singh from about uh, six or seven years that really summarized what we could do in the pre-JWST era. So here you can see that the most common absorption feature that we've seen in a population of hot Jupiters are these water bands that can really range from very high signal to noise ratio detections, like for um, hot Jupiters like HD 209458b, to much lower significance things where we have essentially a high opacity cloud layer in the atmosphere truncating these absorption features. So what this tells us overall is clouds whether they be um, kind of condensate clouds or photochemical hazes producing these steep slopes are common in exoplanet atmospheres. Water absorption is seen almost across the board. And for a couple of planets, we also have signatures of sodium and potassium from both um, ground-based observations and from space-based observations. So in terms of where we are at the moment, if we consider planets as a continuum ranging all the way down from um, low mass stars down to terrestrial planets. Before the launch of JWST, this has been the parameter space that we've been probing primarily with ground-based telescopes and the Hubble Space Telescope. So what I'm summarizing here on the left, these green crosses are every planet in temperature and radius space for which we have a detection of at least one molecular species in the atmosphere. So you can see that most of the detections, just from the ease of um, essentially how large the scale height of the planetary atmosphere is, have been the hot Jupiter population in the top right corner here. But we've been, for a handful of planets, able to push down to planets around about the radius of Neptune with one of the, with two leading contenders that are actually pushing down to temperate temperature planets. So. It's very promising just what we've been able to do, even with telescopes that were not really designed for exoplanet measurements. Most of these detections are water, but we do also have detections of molecules like carbon monoxide at high spectral resolution from the ground and a handful of other detections. So in short, we're at around 83 exoplanet atmospheres that have been detected so far. And this is poised to dramatically expand even just in the first year or two of observations with JWST. There's around about um, 60 to 100 planets that are scheduled to be observed with JWST just in cycle one. So we're going through a dramatic expansion in the number of planets that we can observe and also the types, because as we'll see later in the talk, we're going to start pushing down into the super Earth and terrestrial regime with JWST. So now I want to get on to the meet my talk talking about atmospheric retrieval. So how do we go beyond just detecting a chemical species in a planetary atmosphere? to measure the abundance of it and infer other atmospheric properties like the temperature of these worlds and the cloud and haze properties. So essentially when it comes to modeling these atmospheres, there are two broad approaches that have been followed. So the first approach is really driven by our un fundamental understanding of physics and chemistry. We call it forward modeling. Essentially you take what we know about the planetary environment. So this can be the flux distribution of the host star, the mass and radius of the planet. We use all of these known properties as inputs to solve a system of equations. So this can be hydrostatic equilibrium, um, ranging from simple one-dimensional models all the way up to three-dimensional global circulation models to produce a predicted spectrum of the planet. And these predictions are ultimately what we usually use, like 
right now to try and get telescope time in our proposals. And if the universe actually shines upon us, you might actually find that your initial prediction matches the observations, but in reality, normally there are quite large discrepancies. And that's where my own research typically comes in, which is the inverse approach to this. Essentially, in atmospheric retrieval, we start with the observations and we construct simplified parametric descriptions of what these atmospheric models are actually like. And then using something like a um, Markov chain Monte Carlo approach or nested sampling, we generate hundreds of thousands to millions of possible atmospheres, integrate through the atmosphere to compute the spectra, and then use this to derive probability distributions for what the range of atmospheric properties are that are consistent with the exoplanet spectra. And those are what most often we report in our papers for the measurements of the chemical composition of these atmospheres. And what I hope to show you is that this isn't just magic what is going on here. There's, there's a lot of complexity that goes on inside of the black box and we have a lot of work to do for this higher quality data that we're now getting with GWST. So just to motivate this, this is kind of the state of the art from around 10 years or so ago, before retrievals really entered the scene prominently. So this is a set of real observations of a super-Earth GJ1214b, taken primarily with the Hubble Space Telescope and um, the Spitzer Space Telescope here. And before retrievals entered the scene, essentially it was a lot of chi-squared by i analyses, if you will. You would generate a few very computationally intensive models and what is shown here are two classes of models. The gray models are clear atmospheres, which you can just see by eye are just not a good fit to the observations here, while the red and orange models include cloud opacity and are able to capture that the spectrum is pretty much flat throughout the infrared. But the problem here is that you don't know whether the two models that you concocted, the red and orange ones that can explain these observations, are the only two solutions, or whether there could be a whole family of solutions that can explain your observations. And that is ultimately what retrievals try to solve. So qualitatively, what is going on when a retrieval analysis is run is if you imagine a toy model of an atmosphere parameterized by just the water abundance of the atmosphere and its temperature, you might have one location in the parameter space that is a decent fit, say, to a Hubble spectrum. And a retrieval essentially maps out the parameter space, computing the likelihood function at all the different locations to then explore the range of properties that are consistent with the given observations. And then once you have those, you can then integrate out each parameter of interest, which we call marginalization in the Bayesian lingo, to derive probability distributions for the various properties in the atmosphere. And so, Here's just my conceptual explanation for what a corner plot is before I start scaring you with like 10-dimensional giant triangle plots. That's all that they are. You just integrate out each dimension apart from the one of interest. And from like the, and then typically we quote the, the one sigma width of these distributions about the median when we report properties of exoplanet atmospheres. So I developed during my PhD an atmospheric retrieval code that automates this process where essentially you repeatedly call an atmospheric model that can range in complexity from one-dimensional atmospheres all the way up to three-dimensional, which I'll talk about a little bit towards the end of my talk. And then it goes through an iterative procedure of generating spectra from atmospheric properties, simulating particular instruments, comparing that to a set of observations, and then going through a convergence loop to then derive these probability distributions for the various properties and detection significances of the various components in the atmosphere. And uh, if you come along to my lunch talk, I'll give you a demonstration of what the code is actually like. So there are essentially two things I want to highlight about what goes into this process. One are the modeling assumptions that we ultimately make when we run one of these analyses, and the other ones are fixed inputs that are kind of brushed under the rug a little bit. So in terms of the assumptions we have to make as a modeler when running one of these retrievals, I'll give one example of how we treat aerosols in the atmosphere. So in the Hubble era, um, two toy models that were often employed to fit observations were clouds and hazes. And what I mean by that is a cloud is essentially just 
an optically thick surface that has infinite opacity for every pressures um, higher than a certain cloud top pressure, while a haze has some kind of wavelength dependence, like a power law, for example. And in terms of the effect these simple models have on the spectrum, is a cloud puts in a solid surface that cuts off absorption features, while a haze puts in a scattering slope. And at least in terms of the quality of observations we had pre-JWST, these really simple toy models actually worked quite well for explaining observations. But we'll have to do a little bit better and have more sophisticated aerosol models in the era of JWST. So that's an example of a modeler assumption that you make when running a retrieval. And you can then compare a number of different models to see which one ultimately is the best at explaining the observations. But there are also very important fixed inputs that all of our inferences are contingent upon. And in particular, I want to highlight the opacities or cross-sections that go into these models. So there's, there's a lot that goes into just computing these cross-sections from the choice of the molecular line list databases that you use to what you assume about the background gas, pressure and temperature broadening, but ultimately, all codes that we use to compute spectra of these atmospheres have a database of different molecules, atoms, and ions that encode where these different chemical species absorb. So I'm just going to give a few brief highlights of what we learned before JWC started rewriting the textbook just um, last year. So even with Hubble quality data, what we have seen across a number of studies is that Molecular absorption from water isn't the only game in town. There have been a handful of planets for which there is tentative evidence already for other chemical species like hydrogen cyanide, shown in the top left there. Not the most significant at around the two to three sigma <coughs> level, but this is something we're hoping to confirm with JWST observations. We've also gone beyond just molecular opacity to seeing signatures with the um, UV instruments on Hubble, potentially of bound-free absorption surfaces from the um, H minus an ion. And you can see from these probability distributions that for some species like water, multiple retrieval codes are in agreement. Like we know there's water vapor in hot Jupiters and potentially there's H minus. But for other chemical species, there's considerable disagreement and spread. But all these distributions will be shrinking with the quality of data we get with JWST. And ultimately why we want to detect many more chemical species and measure their abundances is that these different species can probe the underlying atmospheric dynamics and um, processes like photochemistry in these atmospheres. We've also started to get tentative signs that planets are not one-dimensional, which is perhaps not a surprise if you've ever seen an image of Jupiter, for example. But we already have tentative signs that hot Jupiters are not uniformly cloudy, even if they have aerosols in their atmospheres. So for some of the most precise observations we've had pre-JWST, for a handful of hot Jupiters, we can measure not just where the cloud top pressure is, but also the fraction of the terminator of the planet that is cloudy. And we're now following this up with JWST. Yes? Wouldn't that introduce some time dependence to the signal? Because, well, it depends how, if you are locked in the mm -hmm. location, is that taken into account? Um, it hasn't been taken into account to date because we haven't really had much time resolution with the spectrum. But one of the things that we're really excited by, if you can get a separate spectrum during ingress and egress, then you would expect to have time dependence in the fraction of the terminator that's cloudy and maybe even the chemical composition of the atmosphere. So there are multiple proposals that are planning to use JWST to back out this time dependence, but we weren't really able to do it with Hubble quality spectra. And the last thing I want to highlight is that these spectra plants don't just tell us about the planetary atmosphere, but they can also tell us about the star itself. In this nice work by Alex, um, we have this characteristic downwards slope that we see here in this transmission spectrum of WAS79b that we just can't reproduce with any atmospheric origin. Um, if you add a molecule, it's always an additive term that increases the absorption. So what we were seeing in this study was contamination of our spectra by hot regions, faculae on the surface of this star, and you're able to convert this into measurements of the fraction of the stellar photosphere that is covered by these hot active regions. So it's 
bonus information about the star that we can also get out from these observations. And if you're interested more in that, we wrote up a report um, last year that goes into great depth about all the opportunities for what we can learn with these synergies between stars and planets from transmission spectra. And the last thing I want to also highlight is that it's not just space-based observations that have been giving us incredible inferences in the last few years. Ground-based observations, both of directly imaged exoplanets at much higher spectral resolution, um, and also observations of transiting planets at high spectral resolution, are starting to give us really precise measurements of both isotopolog ratios for the first time and the carbon to oxygen ratio in these atmospheres, which is an important formation diagnostic. So the ideal path forward is we'd like to be able to combine JWST quality observations from space with ground-based observations to really pin down what these atmospheres are like. But okay, on to the meat of the matter about how JWST is now rewriting everything that I just told you. So you'll have seen that just a lot of spectra just coming out that have been announced in multiple press conferences. The very first one that um, dropped um, in July was this planet WASP-96b. Um, and I remember when I first saw this, just my jaw dropped at how for the first time we're going beyond 1.7, 1.8 microns that we had with Hubble and getting multiple water features that we've predicted for years, but we can finally spectrally resolve them. We, um, through the early release science program of the transiting exoplanet community, we reported in August the first detection of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. And just a handful of months later, with multiple instruments, we followed this up and obtained a complete spectrum from 0.5 microns all the way out to 5.5 microns of an exoplanet with multiple different instruments, which are all consistent with each other, really demonstrating that not only is JWST working, but we're also getting surprising inferences. So in particular, this mystery little bump that we had here that we glossed over a little bit in our first paper about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but you can just see here, this was an exciting case where our initial forward models were not able to explain what this species actually was. And we had to turn to a combination of models introducing the physics of photochemistry and also retrieval models behind the scenes, which will be published in the months to come, to confirm that this was a, a real chemical species and the only candidate from around 40 or 50 molecules we tried was sulfur dioxide. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a shift between the blue line and the data point that is quite systematic. Mm -hmm. Many sigma. Yes, so this is just because this is, and you can actually see that there are multiple regions that were not worth it. This was just the first model we were able to concoct that was able to explain this. We're doing a much better job with the retrieval analysis that we have coming that can also tweak things like the cloud properties and the pressure temperature profile. So we do have much improved fits for this that will be coming. Um, this was just more of a focus on detecting the species than the um, getting the really detailed fit properties right. So improved fits are coming. And just a couple of weeks ago, we also reported one of the first transmission spectra of a terrestrial planet, which um, Mercedes spoke about earlier this week. And the key takeaway here is that we can now start to actually distinguish between classes of terrestrial atmospheres so in this particular case, um, the spectrum is consistent with a flat line, so it could be that this planet LHS 475b has no atmosphere, but what we can do is rule out atmospheres with a significant abundance of methane. So we can already start to rule out atmospheres like Titan for this planet, and this will only get better over time as we start stacking more and more transits to improve the signal-to-noise ratio on these terrestrial spectra. So these are things that have already been announced, Many of these have either been published or are about to get published. Now I'm going to show you some work that has either been submitted or is about to be submitted for some of the first retrieval results from JWST Spectra. So I showed you the spectrum of WASP-96b earlier. It was the first spectrum that was announced in July from JWST. In this analysis that I'm a co-author on, led by Jake Taylor, we have applied multiple different retrieval codes to try and explain the spectrum of WASP-96b and obtain constraints not just on the temperature profile of the atmosphere, but also on the chemical abundances. And by comparing multiple different retrieval codes, all of which have 
different assumptions about the opacity databases and how we parameterize the atmosphere, we've been able to obtain robust measurements of the atmosphere of this planet that marginalize over uncertainties in our theoretical models. So what we're seeing are measurements of how much water and carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, as well as a rough measurement of how much potassium there is from this absorption feature here, and um, potentially evidence of this blue wing, or, so this red wing of sodium, or that is less confident. So, and it's remarkable just knowing all the different things that go on behind the hood to make these codes actually work, and that we hadn't benchmarked all of these codes in detail before, that we're getting quite good agreement. So it seems that we kind of know what we're doing with our theoretical models, which is encouraging. Um, here is an analysis um, that we'll be submitting shortly by um, Mary Fournier uh, Tondreau out of uh, the University of Montreal. Um, so this is an example of the influence of the star on the spectrum that I mentioned earlier. So here, in addition to the atmospheric signatures from clouds that are flattening this spectrum, water absorption features, and carbon dioxide, we're also seeing that in order to explain this upward slope, it's not sufficient to just have wings of the, the alkali wings from sodium, but some of the little um, features that we have in this region have to be explained by spots from the star itself that are around about um, 600 Kelvin coulomb, the latent photosphere of the star. And this is from the early release observations of the hot Jupiter hat P18b. So keep an eye out for this coming out soon. And in a paper that we just put up on Archive that's going through a review in Nature at the moment, we have also just um, submitted the first retrieval analysis for thermal emission from an exoplanet atmosphere. So everything I've been focusing on so far has just been focused on transmission geometry. Um, but we can also probe by observing the eclipse when the planet goes behind the star, thermal emission from the day side. So what we are seeing here is measurements of the brightness temperature of an ultra-hot Jupiter, WASP-18b. And what we can see here is that because these features are in emission from these water bands, we've been able to definitively establish that the atmosphere of this exoplanet has a thermal inversion in the upper atmosphere that is likely driven by high opacity optical and UV species like titanium oxide, vanadium oxide, or H minus opacity. So we've established that there is a thermal inversion that is robust to our model assumptions, and also that the metallicity of the atmosphere appears to be consistent with the metallicity of its host star. So, um, and this paper is up on archive as of about a week or so ago, if you want to check it out. Also led by, um, in this case, Louis-Philippe Colomb out of Montreal. So those are just some previews of some results that are cutting edge and either going through review or about to be submitted right now. There's a lot more work to be done here. In the last part of my talk, I'd like to focus now on where we need to go next with the retrievals to be able to explain observations. And we know that our observations, sorry, we know our theoretical models are not perfect because in work we have ongoing to try and explain the early release science observation of WASP-39b, um, in many cases, even for our best retrieval models, we can get reduced chi-squares of two or three or so. There's still some degree we need to go, as Avi alluded to, to really make sure that we're pinning down all the complexity hidden in our observations. So when we transition from Hubble observations to JWST, we need a more critical examination of the assumptions that go on inside this black box. And I'm going to focus on three in particular that I'm heavily involved in. The first, the assumption that these atmospheres can be modeled assuming that they are one-dimensional, only with variations in altitude. The second, as we push down to terrestrial atmospheres, that we know what the background atmosphere is made of. In particular, we, it's a common assumption that the atmosphere is hydrogen dominated. And as a bonus towards the end, I'll give an example of a particularly strange system that our models were not really set up to handle. So firstly, multidimensional retrievals. So we know from sophisticated three-dimensional climate models that the atmospheres of these tidy locked hot Jupiters in particular, they're not uniform. So this is to spatial scale. So this lattice surrounding the planet is a sphere with the maximum radial extent of the day side. So just by eye, you can see 
how much smaller the night side is. So there are geometric effects we have to account for as rays go in through the day side and out of the night side to account for the different temperature distribution alone. We also have inhomogeneities and in different regions of the day side and around the terminator plane that we should account for. While in retrievals in the Hubble era, we've just assumed this. So everything is spherical, variations can occur radially outwards, but there is not a variation in the temperature, the chemical composition or cloud properties as we transition from the day side and out of the night side. So I've been putting a lot of work in the last few years to see how we can parameterize some of this complexity here to see if we can actually detect these multidimensional effects. The first key barrier for this is that if we want to be able to compute a million spectra when doing these uh, Bayesian fits, the first key problem was how to make it so we could solve the radio transfer equation for three-dimensional models rapidly enough to be able to do this. So in a study I published with Nicole Lewis last year, we came up with a simplified parametric model that is illustrated here with a coordinate system that essentially shoots rays through a cylindrical coordinate system, computes the absorption um, for a general atmosphere that can vary between the day side and the night side, and then integrates around the terminator plane from the observer's perspective. So this is then a three-dimensional model accounting for the day side and night side variations and from the variations between the east and west of the atmosphere. And the nice thing is that we derived an equation that essentially converts all of this into just a, a contraction between two tensors. It's a double dot product between two arrays that means you can rapidly numerically solve three-dimensional spectra in less than a second. So that's the first problem solved. How do you make three-dimensional spectra fast enough? The next was, what is a simple enough parameterization that you can explore the parameter space? Because if you have a separate temperature profile at every longitude and latitude throughout an atmosphere, very rapidly you would have 100 or more parameters, and potentially even more than the number of data points you have, and then you'll be waiting like a Hubble time to actually fit your spectrum. So what we propose is just a very simple four-parameter model that assumes the atmosphere is uniform in the deep atmosphere. There is a gradient between the day side and the night side in temperature at the top. And you also have a temperature difference in the terminator plane between the morning and the evening terminator. In terms of how this parameterization looks, if you take slices through the atmosphere, this is to scale colored by temperature what it looks like. So it's not a you know, perfect representation of what we have from sophisticated three-dimensional models, but it captures the salient features of the day side to night side temperature and composition gradients, and also the difference from the observer's perspective between the evening and morning limbs of these planets. And animated, this is what the parameter station looks like. So it's a much closer representation of what we actually expect from underlying physics these atmospheres to look like. And we can also account for the non-uniform spatial dependence of clouds in the atmosphere by encoding things like the fraction of the terminator covered by clouds and the angle from the terminator plane where the cloud opacity kicks in. So one of the nice things is that there are actual spectral diagnostics of these 2D and 3D effects that are distinctly different from one-dimensional models that we can use to detect these effects. So to give qualitative intuition for this, essentially, if you have a gradient in the water abundance between the day side and the night side that can arise from thermal dissociation of the water molecule on the day side, this essentially distorts the relative band shapes of the water molecule. While if you have variations between the morning and evening limbs, this instead alters essentially the peak to wing shape of these water bands. And so these two effects are essentially, you can almost imagine them as being like orthogonal in a decomposition. So not only can we distinguish between 1D models and 2D models, but if we have high enough quality observations, we can potentially distinguish between a 2D and 3D model. So this is the theory, and here's the practice. So in some work I'm doing at the moment, I've been looking at seeing whether we can already see signatures of two-dimensional or three-dimensional effects from real observations. And so uh, here's the answer, Avi, that we can get a much better fit to the SO2 band here, using a retrieval analysis, in particular a 2D model,
that accounts in this particular case for differences in the temperature profile and the chemical abundances between the east and west limbs of the planet as it transits in front of the star. And statistically, this 2D model is um, around about um, four sigma preferred over a 1D model. So this is very encouraging. And uh, so, yeah, keep an eye out for that study that I'm working on now in the months to come. And it's not only the chemical and temperature differences. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it back there. Yeah. Uh, four sigma or three sigma, mm -hmm. do you mean evidences or? Yeah, ra ratio of the Bayesian evidences. Um, okay. So base factor then mapped into an equivalent sigma yeah. value. Yeah. But yeah, uh, great question. And we can also measure not only the fraction of the terminator that is cloudy, which is around about 70% for this planet, but using the temperature distribution being inhomogeneous, we can actually measure where in the Terminator plane the cloud starts. So in a kind of cartoon schematic, this is what we're seeing at the moment in the retrievals we're running. It appears that 70% is cloudy, and the angle where this patchy cloud kicks in is around 30 degrees um, translated from the North Pole. So it appears that both the North and the South Pole of this planet are cloudy, and alongside one of the Terminators. And you can't back out this information unless you have an asymmetric temperature distribution which breaks rotational symmetry. So it's very promising already what we can start to infer from GWST quality spectra. So how does the game change when we move away from giant planets into this exciting terrestrial planet regime that we can finally start to unlock with GWST and we will explore much more in the future with the next generation of extremely large telescopes and the Habitable Worlds Observatory? So to give a case study of the TRAPPIST-1 system, current observations pre GWST are basically consistent with everything apart from a hydrogen helium dominated atmosphere. So you can see Venus-like models, water worlds, everything is just consistent within the error bars. But GWST, if we get enough observations, will really change the game here. So what I'm illustrating here is um, what we might hope for if the TAC would deem to give us 100 transits of TRAPPIST-1e, which maybe we can hope for you know, in the next five to 10 years. Like GWST will be around for long enough. In this case, we would have confident detections of water, carbon dioxide, and methane. But it is going to be tricky if we want to get out important components of biosignature pairs like ozone, because um, unfortunately, ozone is a bit of a pesky molecule that has deemed only to absorb at the wavelengths where GWST is least sensitive both at the shortest wavelengths and at the longest wavelengths. So from a retrieval analysis that led by um, Zifan Lin that, um, that I helped out with um, about two years ago, we found that if you push to 100 transits, you can start to infer some evidence of ozone, um, but not really yet any better than about the three sigma level. So you can see this illustrated here that the orange curve is from a retrieval of 10 transits of TRAPPIST-1e. In which case, you can still correctly back out water features and carbon dioxide, but the retrieval is just not confident that ozone here or here is there at all. And incidentally, this is the oxygen A band here. So even with 100 transits, just oxygen seems to be hopeless, unfortunately, with the low resolution, at least, that we have with GWST here. And here I'm illustrating the retrieval results that we could expect with five to 10 transits to get confident detections that there is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere if this planet does resemble something like the Earth. But you really need to be pushing up to much higher numbers of transits even to get a tentative hint of things like biosignatures. I mean, methane you could do, and you might even be able to distinguish between kind of biological flux levels of methane shown in the green posterior here and abiotic levels of methane. But this is just to kind of just to kind of show that we won't be claiming biosignature or anything for many, many years, it's going to take a concerted effort for our community, repeatedly observing these rocky planets, to push down the precisions that we can really do um, these precise measurements. But in principle, it is possible with GWST. And going back to LHS 475B for a moment, just to illustrate one of the important considerations for retrievals that we found, even for this system, is that the priors that we use for non-hydrogen-dominated atmospheres can actually be a really important consideration 
So when I ran retrievals for this system, what we found is that if you assume the background atmosphere is made of molecular nitrogen, for example, which is very similar to what we do for giant planets retrievals, where we assume we know the atmosphere is made of molecular hydrogen, that can actually trick you into giving you upper limits on many gases like methane, carbon dioxide, and water, which is actually entirely come in just from the assumption that you know what the background gas is. If instead you use an agnostic prior that treats all of the N gases equally and accounts for the fact that they all have to sum to one, um, which is called the centered log ratio transformation, then you can actually see that actually you can't really distinguish between a CO2 dominated atmosphere and a water dominated atmosphere, but the hydrogen upper limit is robust. We know the atmosphere is not hydrogen dominated. So this is just a preview of how some of the things we've been able to get away with in the hot Jupiter context will have to be much more careful about when running retrievals of terrestrial planets. So, and incidentally, um, this transformation originally was developed in the context of geology and sample analyses. So it's exciting that some of these principles from other disciplines are now starting to move into the realm that we need to consider them in the context of exoplanets. So priors are really important when we don't know what the background gas actually is. And the last bonus thing I'll highlight is a fun thing that I'm working on, namely um, what we can learn about post-main sequence planets. So I was particularly inspired by the discovery of um, this giant planet around a white dwarf by Andrew. Thanks for joining, Andrew. Um, in this just beautiful um, light curve that we see here with a 56% transit depth, which just from the discovery of this planet, which is mind-boggling and it's like eight times larger than its star, it violates so many assumptions that go into our models. And it also shows us that intact planets can survive around white dwarfs and that post-main sequence migration has to be occurring. But it was a bit of a problem for our models. So I developed a time-resolved radio transfer code just to be able to consider how the spectrum of this planet varies with time, which is an important consideration when we just can't assume that the planet completely overlaps its star anymore. And we used this code to put together a GWST program that I'm leading, looking at what we actually might be able to measure for the atmospheric composition of this planet. Um, and our observations will be occurring in April, so we're pretty excited to see. So if this atmosphere resembles something like the modern Jupiter, because the equilibrium temperature of this planet is 160 Kelvin, we expect to see features of methane and ammonia throughout the spectrum, and potentially some weaker signatures from water vapor and maybe even phosphine. And since this star is so dim, we can use the NERSPEC prism to get the entire spectral range all in one go. So this is roughly what we're expecting to see from simulated observations, which converted into constraints on the atmosphere should lead to remarkably precise constraints on how much ammonia, methane, water, and phosphine there is in the atmosphere. And since we expect these molecules at this temperature to be the primary carriers of nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, and phosphorus, we can even convert, convert these into simultaneous measurements of four elemental ratios in the atmosphere, which can potentially give us constraints on the post-main sequence evolution of this planet and maybe even its original formation history. So keep an eye out, keep an eye out for when we get this data out, hopefully later this year. And the last teaser is that although this is a giant planet, if we can discover rocky planets around white dwarfs, yep, we're both very excited about this. Then an Earth-like planet around a white dwarf is almost the same radius as the white dwarf. So this would be the absolute ideal case to probe the atmospheres of terrestrial planets. And in a study led by Lisa Kautnegra and myself a couple of years ago, we established that you could detect the methane and ozone biosignature in just 25 transits with GWST to greater than five sigma significance, which since the orbital period of um, a planet like this will just be 10 hours, it's like two weeks to capture enough transits to be able to get a five sigma detection of a biosignature. So Andrew, please find one of these planets for us. So, um, and with that, I will just leave up uh, my conclusions. And uh, again, thanks for uh, 
taking some time not writing your JWST proposals to hear about all of this. So, we finish at 12.55? That? Yeah, or at the hour. At the hour? Okay. So, you got plenty of time for questions, like 15, okay, Avi? Um, so, you infer, let's say, the temperature difference, even in your 3D models, between the mm -hmm. day side and the night side, and the question is whether it's hydrostatically acceptable, in the sense mm -hmm. um, there could be very strong winds moving close to the speed of sound and changing the structure or composition. Have you thought about dynamical effects? Mm -hmm. So at the moment, um, no, it's just assuming a local hydrostatic equilibrium in each column of the atmosphere. But because it is freely parameterized, if there were to be winds that could distort like the temperature distribution from the observer's perspective between the morning and evening terminator, just from the fitting process, you would be able to extract if one side was more spatially extended because of a, um, a higher temperature, for example. But um, no, in terms of the underlying equations, it's still assuming higher yeah, static equilibrium. The, the winds is through drop Doppler broadening, if you mm -hmm. see that being more than the thermal width, yep. that would tell you something, the Doppler shifts. Yeah, yeah absolutely. This is all just low resolution, transmission spectroscopy I'm talking about here, but absolutely, uh, many of our high resolution colleagues have measurements of these winds, and even, I mean, even from a couple of years ago, like potential asymmetries between the limbs. So that's why I say absolutely the dream would be a simultaneous fitting of both high resolution, um, spectra resolved individual lines, coupled with JWST low resolution observations to get out the abundances. So yeah, that's a very promising avenue in the future. Yeah. Sure. Uh, first of all, wonderful talk. Uh, so my understanding, this might be wrong, because I, I, I think it would by a little quick, is there, you have essentially a, a sort of 2D raster on the surface of, of the planet that you're modeling, mm -hmm. representing uh, many of the variables of the problem, right, including cloud cover. So yep. I'm curious, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you have these very complicated sort of 3D circulation models. Is it possible to vet your model against those which are much higher resolution uh, representations of these things? And in that case, do you get posteriors on this cloud cover distribution that you can interpret? Are there sort of projection degeneracies? Uh, have you tried that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, in principle, you can take one of the three-dimensional climate models um, interpolate that onto uh, the grid of a model like I have here, shoot rays through, compute the spectrum, and see how that compares to the parameterization that we have. Um, that work is still kind of ongoing, um, so I won't say too much about it, but it seems that things overall are working, at least with the quality of the initial observations we're getting. But what I was showing was just the simplest parameterization that you could imagine, um, just because it only requires up to four free parameters per molecule that you would have. But you could absolutely always, you can always add more parameters. The tricky thing is coming up with kind of the minimum model that at least capture what the GCMs are showing us. Great, thank you. Yeah. Great talk, Graham. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to figure out um, how things are uh, uh, working in Poseidon, you know, if you have to mm -hmm. manually change certain things. So you discovered SO2, and as Mercedes explained to us, it's a product of photochemistry of H2S, right? Mm -hmm. So did you look for H2S as well, or, uh, and uh, uh, is it automatically picked up in Poseidon while it's your conclusion in photochemistry, or it's... Uh... Yeah. Um, yes, uh, we, we looked for H2S. We, we tried to do a, a blind analysis, essentially, when we saw that mystery feature. Um, us retrieval people, like, we closed down Slack, refused to look at anything that anyone was talking about, and I just tried about 50 different species to make sure that we weren't tricking ourselves into thinking. I was hearing rumors about SO2, but I tried everything. So um, H2S is a bit tricky. So for some of the data sets and for some of the retrieval codes, we do get a posterior peak for H2S, but then in other codes, we're not seeing it. So um, we're not claiming a detection of H2S with the data that we have at the moment. Uh, but the SO2 is coming out consistently. So, so then you assume that it's just completely destroyed, that's why you don't see it, or uh, it's just a, so it's all deep in the atmosphere and you cannot see it on the top of the atmosphere. What's an assumption? Why don't you see H2S if it was there at the right Yeah, well, well that, that's what I like about these parameterized models, that we don't, we don't have to put in like, kind of like the physics and like model the photochemistry itself. What we're essentially fitting for is we assume the abundances of molecules like SO2 and H2S are uniform with altitude, although we can relax that if we want to. 
um, and then we fit for it. Um, and then in the case of H2S, often what we get is either like a two sigma upper limit on its abundance, which can inform what is actually physically going on. Because um, then we'll, we'd be probing something like um, uh, 10 to the minus two bar or so with the abundance upper limit of H2S that we have. And then we can then feed that into the photochemical model to see what they can actually tell us. But, uh, but yeah, the, the belief that we have is that H2S is ultimately being kind of consumed in the process of the SO2 formation. So I do have one relevant question, uh, I guess, uh, about uh, certain assumptions about vertical distributions of molecules. So, so you did mention that you want to look for ozone, right? In a terrestrial atmosphere, it's all uh, up there. So five micron band of uh, ozone in the limb uh, satellite measurements, you can see it very well. So uh, what are the assumptions about vertical distributions you make for mm -hmm. practice, for instance? Yeah, I was, I was actually looking into this a little bit with, um, with a student about a year or so ago in the context of even further future observations. So if we had something like Louvois, could we actually measure a vertical distribution of ozone? And um, because then you've definitely not got a vertical distribution, you have something that kind of looks like a, you know, obviously like a big bump. So we tried fitting something like a, um, a Gaussian distribution or something to it to then see if you could actually get that out. And it was very challenging, even with Louvois quality observations to, um, to measure uh, precisely like it was. So at least as we could tell, um, you couldn't, we didn't see a statistical improvement in the quality of the fit from having like a six parameter function trying to fit the maximum abundance of ozone and how it varied with altitude. Um, but um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't published that. So yeah, it, it will be challenging to get that out. I mean, well, it's even challenging even to detect ozone, at least with JWST. Um, but in principle, the better your data is, anything is possible. You're only limited your creativity when coming up with these parameterizations. Yep. Do you have thoughts on, for sort of the science of retrieval, would you rather spend a lot of JWST time on a few planets, or would you want to survey broadly? Mm -hmm. What do you think the right way to strategize that push? Yeah, I think, I think a good strategy is a combination of very, very deep programs focused on many transits for a couple benchmark hot Jupiters with very high signal to noise ratios to really confirm our understanding of the underlying physics and chemistry of what is going on. So unfortunately, there are, there are some planets that we really like to observe, but JWST just, the stars are too bright um, in particular. So WASP-39b, which we've seen just by eye, you can see these features like the close to 30 sigma detection of CO2, that by far is not one of the best hot Jupiters to observe. It's actually a rather dim star, so much higher signal to noise ratio observations will be coming. So my preference would be, we need, we need broad surveys to make sure that we're capturing the diversity of planetary atmospheres, especially when looking at objects like um, potential lava worlds in concert with rocky planets in the habitable zone and hot Jupiters to capture the diversity. But for at least a handful of planets in each category, we really need deep surveys where we continually stack observations to really push our models to the limits. So let's do it all. <laughs> yeah. Any, anyone have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so you talked about this in the beginning about how there's an assumption where clouds is just uh, straight gray uh, throughout and then hazes are, uh, have a scattering. Um, do you think there's a necessity to kind of change that so to where clouds are not grave throughout all wavelengths now with James Webb? Yep. Yeah, the, there's, there's a lot of work that's been going on in the last few years looking at incorporating me scattering properly into retrievals. So you could try directly retrieving things like the, the mean particle size or maybe like the width of the particle size distri distribution parameters. Um, it, it's tricky because a lot of those me scattering retrievals at the moment assume something about the chemical composition of the cloud species. Um, in my mind, a flexible approach that would have something like a parameterization of the real and imaginary refractive indices of the aerosol and its wavelength dependence, because we know that real aerosols will not just be purely made of just one substance and have one particle size distribution. Um, so. But yes, in short, we expect to see me scattering in the form of aerosols that appear 
opaque at shorter wavelengths but then tail off at longer wavelengths. And once we have a clear detection of something like that, then the game begins of trying to come up with what the most flexible parameterization is that can really capture the properties of those aerosols. But yeah, absolutely non-gray aerosols is going to be a very active area that we need to look at, especially with mid-infrared observations that should be able to capture these resonance features from a light silicate cloud at about uh, 10 microns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, maybe if we get one of these uh, white dwarf uh, terrestrial planets, then we'll actually have a hope at CFCs. Hi, there we have one more question. So this HEP-18B planet, that CO2 uh, looks a little bit less convincing than uh, in VASP 39B, so uh, how do you measure like degree of confidence on base, because it, it didn't Mm -hmm. Will completely lining up, right? It, it's, uh... Yeah, that, that's more like three sigma instead of those sigma. It's just because that, that CO2 band, as you, as you know, at these shorter wavelengths is just um, inherently much less strong than the one at 4.3 microns. Um, so, I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe someone might submit a GeoSD proposal to get the longer wavelengths, and then we, <laughs> then we can actually see it. Okay, well, we have three minutes, and I have one more question. Does anyone mm -hmm. else have a question? Well, unless someone wants to submit a proposal on this. <laughs> there are a lot of proposals being submitted. I dread to think what the competition is going to be in cycle two. Um, so you said you were talking about like the comparing many different retrievals. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, uh, do you have like a sense on the similarities and assumptions that the retrievals make, and and uh, and how much that affects? how similar the retrieval results mm -hmm. are? So the, the assumptions in terms of how things are parameterized for our one-dimensional models, um, they're, re they're reasonably similar across most of the codes. Um, and we, we do have like a big study that we've been working on for many months that will be trying to fit all four of the transmission spectra of WASP-39B consistently with 10 different retrieval codes to really be able to pin down and quantify which assumptions are most important and if the codes are differing, why they're differing. Um, but thus far we're seeing reasonably good agreement so long as all the codes include the same chemical species and a similar prescription for the, the aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, so no, the, the assumptions at least, there are reasonably standard models at the moment. Most of the deviations will come yeah, in follow-on theoretical studies that will follow. Like we're, we're trying to make sure that we're at least applying similar models to the observations at the moment, but all the fun will come when we start throwing you know, 2D, 3D models at things, me scattering aerosols. Um, so we're, we're very much still in a learning process of just figuring out what model complexity is just needed to be able to fit geodiversity observations. And that won't be a, there won't be a quick answer. It will take us a couple of years to really pin down what we're missing in our retrieval models. So would it be surprised if there was like some, you find something later on that no retrieval considered that would mm -hmm. be required. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Any more questions? Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.